Hi everybody, I just wanted to go over some of the digestive system physiology handouts that we have. These are just the loose ends uh, after we got through our uh, mainstay packet, the uh, large digestive system packet. And basically these are just the answers that I posted in their own separate folder on the main uh, folder within the Blackboard site. It, or that is, I'm sorry, it's called main course folder, you know, with the, the one with the triple stars on either side of the heading. Well. I'm not going to go back and uh, fill in the answers for you. You guys have the answers. But what I would like to do is I'd like to go over this diagram that actually came from our lab. And this basically just shows all these different layers that we have outlined in this packet. And I just wanted to highlight them for you while I, I talk about them, basically just going over the same information that, that's uh, outlined in the packet. So let me get this started here. I guess we'll just use red like we have been before. So I'm just going to highlight the um, mucosa for you first. So the mucosa is the innermost layer. Um, the innermost part of the mucosa is actually established by the epithelium, which is simple columnar epithelium. So it's just one layer of these columnar shaped cells. And so I'm going to highlight that for you right now. You see I'm drawing it in with red. I'm actually drawing in the apical surface of the cells first that is the surface that's facing the lumen, the open cavity within the GI tract. The foodstuffs is passing through. So you can see that I'm highlighting this apical surface. Now remember, if we were to look at the apical surface at a closer view, you would see that there are these tiny little microscopic finger-like extensions coming from each of these cells called the microvilli. But we cannot see the microvilli from this view. We're too far away to be able to see that kind of detail. All right. Almost there. Okay, so now I'm going to highlight the basolateral side of these columnar cells. This is the side that's actually facing the underlying connective tissue called the lamina propria, which is the next part of the mucosa that we're going to highlight. So you can see these little divisions that separate uh, these little columnar cells from one another. We're too far away, however, to see anything more detailed. For example, we can't really see the nuclei. Although I do believe that there's these tiny little, almost like hatch marks, if you will, within each cell, or at least some of the cells that indicate that there is a nucleus within each of these columnar cells. Incidentally, you guys remember from AP1, that in simple columnar epithelium, the nuclei all line up in the same area of all these cells. So when you look at these cells, you see this line of nuclei that parallels the very orderly arrangement of the columnar cells themselves. And the nuclei are going to be more towards that basolateral surface. Okay, so now let's highlight the lamina propria. Lamina propria is the loose connective tissue. It's mainly areolar connective tissue uh, that serves as the basement membrane that these columnar cells sit upon. So let's change colors for that. Let's do a color that contrasts nicely with the red. Let's do blue. So maybe we can zoom in. Oh, yeah, so we can zoom in. Very nice. All right. So I'm going to color in the lamina appropriate. And I don't think I'm going to color in the whole lamina appropriate, but I want to at least give you guys a good gut level sense, no pun intended, of where the boundaries of these different layers lay. 
Remember, I always tell you that drawing is the most powerful study tool you have for biology. So never hesitate to just get out a scratch pad and start trying to draw these structures as best as you can. I know a lot of people say, well, I'm not a good drawer. Well, if you really do it slowly and carefully, or possibly even use tracing paper, then you should be able to create some pretty suitable diagrams. So by the way, you also see a lot of lymph nodules um, within the lamina propria as well. And you guys know what those are after studying the uh, lymphatic system. And here's an example of that right here. So remember that these are like congregations of B cells with that germinal center right in the middle that I just circled for you. So I think that's it. We don't have to color in any more of the lamina propria. Hopefully you guys get the idea. All right, so deep to the lamina propria, we have a very, very thin layer of smooth muscle. And I'm going to yeah, bring this out a little bit more. And we're going to color in that layer of smooth muscle. And uh, let's see, let's do the fuchsia color instead, just because we already drew the um, simple columnar epithelium in red. So I kind of want to avoid using red, even though red would probably be the most appropriate color for muscle. So this is a very, very thin sheet-like layer of smooth muscle. This is going to be the most superficial layer of the mucosa. It's called the muscularis mucosa because it is, in fact, part of the mucosa, not surprisingly. And while this diagram does not show this well, it's the muscularis mucosa that actually establishes the architecture for the villi. So if you remember, the villi are actually these pendulous uh, structures or, or ripples, or actually ripples is not the best term. I guess the best term would be conical-like um, uh, projections of the epithelium into the lumen of the alimentary canal. So this would be a singular villus right here as it's labeled. And then villi is the term that we use for the entirety of all of these finger-like or cone-like projections that face inwards um, within the lumen of the GI tract. So it's actually the muscularis mucosa that's establishing the contours of this. However, this diagram does not do a very good job at really uh, doing that um, particular function any justice. Um, okay, so I think that's it. So uh, superficial to the muscularis mucosa and the entire mucosa as a whole, we have our submucosa. And the submucosa is already shaded in quite well in this kind of light blue color. So I don't think that I have to emphasize that any more than it already is. is and in the submucosa, you have a large network of neurons called Meissner's plexus, which is uh, mainly a parasympathetic ganglia. If you remember, parasympathetic neurons are motor neurons of our autonomic nervous system, meaning that we don't have any conscious control over them. And, and they are promoting um, uh, the digestive functions of this um, uh, particular organ. So remember when we talked about the autonomic nervous system in AP1, we talked about how the sympathetic nervous system is for fight and flight responses and the parasympathetic nervous system is for rest and digest functions. Well, this is the digest of rest and digest. And not surprisingly, that's the main function of this tissue um, as a whole, or not tissue rather, but this organ as a whole anyway. So all of the major functions um, that are occurring here as far as digestion occurs are ultimately being facilitated and augmented and um, controlled by uh, this network of neurons. And then another network of neurons that we'll talk about when we talk about the muscularis layer. So you're also gonna see lots of mucus secreting glands embedded within this uh, part of the organ as well, or this part of the alimentary canal as well. So I'm gonna highlight one of those glands for you right here. I guess we'll do it in yellow, because we haven't used yellow yet. 
right? So here we have a mucus secreting gland, and then here's a little duct through which that mucus is expelled out onto the surface of um, the epithelium of the mucosa. And this uh, mucus is mainly there to just help um, decrease the friction as the foodstuffs is passing along the inner surface of the alimentary canal. All right, so now let's move on to the muscularis layer. This is where we have the smooth muscle that is responsible for the movements of peristalsis and segmentation. So I just wanna highlight those layers for you. So let's do green for the innermost layer of the muscularis layer. So this innermost layer of the muscularis layer is called the circular layer, and that's because the smooth muscle fibers are arranged circumferentially around the lumen of the alimentary canal. And so I'm just going to kind of loosely color in this muscul um, rather circular layer of your muscularis layer in green. All right, and then the more superficial layer of the muscularis layer is the longitudinal layer. And as the name suggests, this is where the smooth muscle fibers are actually arranged longitudinally. That is along the uh, long axis or the length of um, the alimentary canal. So let's change colors for that. And I think we'll do orange to emphasize the longitudinal layer. Although the orange on this kind of comes out to be more of a copper color. All right, so here we have the longitudinal layer of our muscularis layer. And then finally, the outermost layer is our serosa. Now, the serosa comes in two different flavors. You can just have a serous membrane, as the name uh, serosa indicates. I'll do purple for this. And that's what you see here. You just see one sheet, or I should say a sheet, rather, of one layer of squamous-shaped epithelium cell, epithelial cells, sometimes specified as mesothelial cells. And what happens is, is you guys remember that the entire abdominal pelvic cavity is enshrouded by peritoneum? Well, that peritoneum folds in on itself at certain key points in the abdominal pelvic cavity to form a mesentery, which is basically this two-layer sheet of this peritoneum. The peritoneum is just this one-cell layer thick uh, serous membrane. So here we have the mesentery. Then what happens is the mesentery splits so that this serous membrane then enshrouds the entire organ. As it does so, it becomes the serosa. That's what the serosa is. All right, so we'll talk more about that coming up very shortly. So sometimes what happens is, is parts of the alimentary canal are actually back behind the parietal peritoneum. For example, your ascending and descending colons, uh, your duodenum. They actually lay behind the curtain, curtain wall, that is, of your parietal peritoneum, that peritoneum that surrounds the outer boundaries of your abdominal pelvic cavity. If that's the case, the serosa is actually just kind of this patchwork of disorganized connective tissue. It's basically areolar or connective tissue. So those are the two different flavors that you can find as far as your um, serosa goes. Uh, the better term for this outermost layer or serosa when you have this uh, connective tissue outermost uh, boundary instead of the serous membrane uh, is adventitia. Adventitia. So this is the same term that we used for blood vessels as well. Remember that outermost or superficial layer of blood vessels that's established by loose connective tissue? We called it either the tunica externa or the adventitia. So again, the serosa basically becomes the adventitia um, if it does not actually, um, or I should say a better way to phrase it, if it is not actually composed of serous membrane. All right. So... Let's talk about 
mesentery. So I just diagrammed out the mesentery for you in this diagram, or highlighted the mesentery in this diagram. So we talked about a mesentery is a double layer extension of the peritoneum, specifically the parietal peritoneum, where it folds in on itself to form this double serous membrane sheet, which then stretches out to envelop and enshroud different organs suspended within the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we have to know about these uh, sheets of mesentery from a gross anatomical perspective. And these are the ones we want you to know about. You have your mesentery, all right? So this is the mesentery actually called the mesentery. This is the outward fold of serous coat um, that uh, covers the uh, small intestine and basically tethers the small intestine to the abdominal wall. Uh, you have your mesocolon. Uh, this is an extension of the large intestine, or rather, um, a better way to say it would be that it actually uh, reaches out and enshrouds the transverse uh, colon of your large intestine. Uh, we have your lesser omentum, which is a stretch of mesentery that connects your liver to the lever lesser curvature of your stomach. Remember, we talked about this when we talked about the lesser curvature of your stomach. The greater omentum is this large fatty apron that basically extends from your uh, greater curvature of your stomach and then comes back upon itself to attach to the transverse colon of your large intestine. And then finally, we already talked about your falciform ligament. The falciform ligament basically attaches the um, liver to the superior border of the abdominal pelvic cavity, which is established by the diaphragm. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the PowerPoint presentation and actually show you mid-sagittal view of an abdominal pelvic cavity that shows all of these layers for you quite well. So I'm going to go and, and, and look at the pen function up here so we can choose our colors. It's not working very well here. Okay, that's right. I got to change or I got to touch the little gear icon here. All right, so I'm going to highlight these mesenteries basically sticking to the same colors that the authors have. So I'm highlighting the parietal peritoneum for you right now, which is actually is not mesentery, but still is important because ultimately the mesenteries are derived from it. So I'm surrounding, or rather highlighting, this parietal peritoneum that enshrouds the outer boundaries of the abdominal pelvic cavity. I'm going to go up here. And then right here, I want you to take... Pay close attention, I'm zooming in for you. Right here at the superior most aspect of the abdominal pelvic cavity, just inferior to the diaphragm, the diaphragm is this dome-shaped structure right here at the most superior aspect of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Right here, this is where your parietal peritoneum folds on upon itself to form that falciform ligament. So I'm going to change colors. We'll go up to the little gear and we'll switch over to blue, I guess. So now look at what happens. Look at the color change here. Now what happens is we're making our falciform ligament as the parietal peritoneum at the superior most aspect of the abdominal pelvic cavity folds in on itself and then it separates to enshroud the liver. And in effect, it ends up helping to suspend the liver in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So when you look at the glistening surface of a liver from a cadaver, that glistening surface is actually established by this serous membrane that ultimately resulted from an infolding of the parietal peritoneum. So again, this is your falciform ligament. All right. So now what happens is, is this serous membrane that enshrouds the liver comes back upon itself right here. We we'll use the orange, I guess, since we don't have yellow on our color palette. It comes back upon itself to form another mesentery. This is our lesser omentum. And the lesser omentum is the sheet-like structure that connects the liver to the stomach. And this is a cross-section of the stomach right here. So then that same serous membrane then enshrouds the stomach. So we'll draw that in, in blue. And then it comes back upon itself 
again to form this other mesentery, which we call the great omentum, or the greater omentum, I'm sorry. So now I think I'm going to draw the greater omentum in with... Uh, we're running out of colors here, aren't we? Maybe we'll do it in with the highlighter. Maybe that will work. Uh, no, I think the highlighter is too large. I guess we'll just, uh, I want to show it contrasting. Let's do orange. All right, so again, this serous membrane that surrounds the stomach comes back upon itself to form the greater omentum. And so here's the greater omentum. And like I said before, the greater omentum folds upon itself. So it starts off as two layers, but then those two layers fold upon themselves to form a grand total of four layers, and there's lots of adipose tissue or fat, otherwise known as visceral fat, that's embedded between these four layers. So now what happens is then it comes back to enshroud your transverse colon. You can see right here your transverse colon in cross-section. So now this serous membrane enshrouds the transverse colon, and then it comes back upon itself to form your transverse mesocolon. So now let's draw in the transverse mesocolon, another mesentery that we gave reference to. And then the transverse mes... I'm sorry, I almost said transverse mesentery. Transverse mesocolon then separates to become, once again, part of your parietal peritoneum, in effect, helping to tether that transverse colon to the posterior wall of your abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, finally, down here, we get to the mesentery we know as mesentery, simply mesentery. And I'm just going to show this in blue because we don't have purple. Right here, you can see how the mesentery basically originates from the parietal peritoneum at the posterior wall of the abdominal pelvic cavity, where it comes together to form this fold. And then it comes out to elaborately enshroud your ilium and jejunum of your small intestines. That's what's all going on in here. Does that make sense to everybody? It's kind of a complex concept to get at first because it's just weird anatomy. If you've never heard of this before, you know, it, 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 it just seems kind of strange. It's not straightforward. Oftentimes it's not something that people go out of their way to explain to people because it's difficult to explain verbally. But I think, you know, with this tool being able to highlight the uh, diagrams directly, uh, you know, it's a little bit more feasible to, uh, to go over this topic. So I don't know what I did there, but I think it's okay because I want to end the presentation anyways. So anyways, I'll see you guys soon when we talk about uh, the physiology of digestion. And then uh, we'll talk very briefly about absorption as well. See you soon.